Welcome to The Roundtable, a podcast of Lakeside Church. We hope today's discussion leaves you encouraged. For more information on how to connect, please visit our website, lakesidechurch.ca. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors at Lakeside Church, and we just thought it was a good idea to have a space where you could ask questions, whether they're about the message, church life, what's going on in the world right now, and uh, thought every every once in a while put out a special episode with some of our team members or pastors and uh, get to just dialogue a little bit with you on some of those things. And so I want to introduce, or many of you know already, uh, Daniel Bell, who's our site pastor, and Robin Elliott, who is our pastor of discipleship and spiritual growth. No, leader, no. Di- <laughs> spiritual growth and leadership spiritual growth development? and leadership development, if that uh, matters. <laughs> if that ma- so tell us quickly then, what does that mean exactly? Whatever you want it to mean, Mark. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I'm like, hey, this is, this is in your job description, right? Can you do this? Right. Yeah. Is that how it goes? <laughs> pretty much, yeah. 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 I have a lot of fun. Yeah, it's good. And Daniel, you're, you were our youth pastor. Now you're our site pastor. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I oversee our uh, downtown site here in Guelph. Um, and yeah, basically do a whole bunch of stuff too for a small amount of people smaller amount of people but share some stuff with you guys all as well yeah no it's so so good and uh as we're starting our conversation we were kind of messaging back and forth trying to figure out what do we call this like it's kind of a round table discussion but we need a cool name and uh, i think i noticed that the only person who offered any suggestions was daniel and uh daniel here's here just i don't think these were meant to go public but let me just read you some of daniel's ideas uh number one covid and coffee <laughs> Number two, they, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Coffee, Christ, and coronavirus. I don't know if you thought that rhymed, but it doesn't. No. Um, clergy and coffee, which I never refer to myself as clergy unless I'm trying to get a discount on parking. Do you guys ever use that? Like, no. No. Have you found Only on that, like, uh, tax forms? <laughs> tax forms. Is there any other benefit to being a pastor or with those titles? Uh, hospital visits. Hospital yeah. visits, parking. Not in Guelph, though. Um, not yeah, not in, yeah, it's true. <laughs> in Toronto, I used to do yeah. that, but it doesn't help here. Um, and then the last one was, this one, according to Daniel, a double entendre. It's the pour over, because we're having coffee, and we're pouring over conversation in scripture. And okay, how so, Guelph. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, all I have to say, if you have a creative bone in your body, please do better and send us your ideas. We would really appreciate that. Um, please do. Yeah, but as we're going, we're going to be honest, we're, as you can see, we're in our house, we're starting this round table in the midst of the coronavirus. And so um, it's real, two of us have young kids, so there may be an interruption. I told my wife, I'm like, can you try and keep the kids away? And she's like, I can promise you one thing. If they do interrupt you, I'll try and make sure they have clothes on. That was it. So the, the bar is low. Uh, and yesterday, Robin, I, if you remember this, but we were on the phone yesterday, so you couldn't see this, but all of a sudden I just scream, I gotta go. And I hung up on Robin. And what had happened was my daughter came down and she's like, she's about two and a half. She's like, I play quietly over here. I'm like, okay, no problem, Kaya. And she somehow grabbed a ruler off my desk. And all of a sudden I look over and she's bending the ruler, actually bending it this way. And then all of a sudden it snaps and hits her right in the neck. Now, can I just show you, this is the actual ruler. Look at this. Does this not look like a prison weapon? This is what hit her in the throat <laughs> in the middle of our conversation. So anyways, um, I just thought you'd appreciate seeing that in real life. But uh, as we get going, yeah, there may be some interruptions, but we're just going to keep rolling. But we had some questions from you this week, and so we want to jump into those. We just finished our Unclaimed series. We're starting a brand new series this Sunday called Scandalous, so don't miss it. But here are some of the questions. You guys good if we just jump in right away? Yeah. All right, so this, this first one's a long one. It gave examples because I think they assumed and probably rightly so that we wouldn't get it. So here we go. Um, what are some of the ways we as individuals and also our government leaders can apply the main points of the Unclaimed series to finding effective ways of dealing with the current COVID-19 pandemic? For example, in Unclaimed, our pastors put a priority on finding more time for adequate rest and less anxiety in our lives. But at the same time, we're seeing individuals who just can't seem to slow down, can't seem to follow guidelines for living safely during the pandemic. 
and governments anxiously putting a rush on getting economies back up to speed, putting their own health at risk and the health of many others. Uh, so interesting question, just really reacting to what's going on in our world and uh, what do we do in the midst of this? And, uh, and so I think the first thing that comes to mind, but Ding, I'm gonna get you to comment on this, is we can see all the things that are going on in our world, but it's, it's not really our mandate to force people and how they react. It's not our mandate to tell government what to do. I, I know you have a big passion about this, Daniel. What is our mandate as Jesus followers? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I really think that's true. Um, that it's, you know, there's different realms that we, we function in, right? We are not, um, as Jesus followers, in charge of the economy, but rather, um, as, as a church, we care for people's souls. Um, we help people really follow Jesus, to love Jesus, to love others in that sort of way. Um, so when it comes, to, in my mind, to seeing um, the government's responsibility in these sort of ways, I really think we leave that in their hands and rather um, we live out what it means to love others, what it means to care for people's souls in a time like this. Um, and we model the behavior that we think um, is, you know, the best and safest during this time as well. Mm. I like, I like the language of we model, not mandate. And I think that's good. Yeah. Jesus following, even as pastors, I think I I'm just discovering more and more. My, my job is to teach and to model, but to force and mandate and try and, you know, uh, dictate through law. It's, it's not the Jesus way. And so yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, can I ask maybe a follow up question to that is for those people who are directly involved in lines of work where they're maybe on the front lines in healthcare looking for a cure, like the, the, the thing that's kind of coming top down is bigger, better, faster, cheaper. Like we need to solve this right now. How do we continue to live out the Jesus way in the midst of that? Do we just buck the whole system and say, forget it. I don't want any part of it. Or, you know, for people who are practically dealing with that, how do they slow down? How do they find desert experiences in the midst of this? And that could be for either of you. One of the things, uh, Mark, that, that I found really helpful is that we have at least I grew up in this mindset of striking a balance, always having a balanced life. And I was freed from that a number of years ago. And I wish I could remember the author that freed me, but it was more about rhythms. So nature follows a rhythm and Christ followed a rhythm. And when we strike for balance, we set ourselves up for defeat mm. uh, because we are, we, we can't find balance. And if, you know, if you're an accountant and it's tax season, if you're in this, in this situation where you're a frontline worker, and you're short staffed, you know, maintaining that balanced life and the, the weekly Sabbath and just adds more pressure. It, it becomes legalism, really. I think when we, when we strive for rhythm so that you, you push hard like spring and then you know that there's a time of summer coming, there's a time of rest coming. And, and you know, you make sure that you're just not going from spring to spring to spring. And of course, well, like it helps people in your life that keep you accountable. But I think for us who aren't on the front lines directly right now, we need to be doing the most we can to however we can help these people to just glean those little moments of, of respite. I don't know how we do that. I mean, unless you have someone who's directly in your family or your home, uh, for the rest of us, we can't actually go out and help them, but we certainly can be giving them permission and doing what we can, like staying home, mm. so that we're not putting them in harm's way. Oh, that's so good. I love that. Yeah. Idea. Oh, sorry, Daniel, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just going to agree with that in the sense, um, I love how you know Jesus calls us, in a sense, to live a countercultural life, a life that is quite different, and these practices and these rhythms don't really fit in um, with the world, but yet we live in the midst of this culture, in the midst of this world, and sometimes things don't always work the way we want them to, or we can't always prioritize the things we want to. And I think that, you know, Jesus models this. I think, Mark, I think you may have taught on this where, you know, um, he went to, to rest and spend time with God. And then, you know, the people were like, they, need, they needed some more Jesus. And so he spent time with them and then did some of those practices after. And I think that it's accurate that we all come through different seasons and times where you know you have rhythms and priorities change um and it's good to be gracious with ourselves in that yeah i love the idea of being gracious understanding the season and robin I, i've never heard it before but let's just make sure we don't go from spring to spring to spring to spring i think of a, a friend of mine who's a pastor in manitoba and he talks about how they have farmers and they have people who are at the military base and both those industries 
have seasons where they're full on from the moment they wake up to the moment they go down. And so they understand rhythms and seasons, whether it's harvesting time or if it's just maintenance time. And so, yeah, that's so good versus the like, no, every day is going to look the same for every Jesus follower. And this, I love that. So that's so good. Uh, let's jump to second question, which is uh, how do you find silence and solitude when you're stuck at home right now with family? Daniel, you want to jump on that one? Yeah, you just lock the, the kids in the bathroom um, and go to another floor and that's it. <laughs> you know, I think it's uh, important that we first come to see that silence and solitude are valuable. Um, that, and that silence and solitude doesn't just mean isolation and being alone. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't just mean, you know, pushing people away. It doesn't mean pushing activities away, although that can be part of it. Um, I think silence and solitude aren't a place um, we leave other things from, but rather a place we retreat to. Um, and so silence and solitude, I think, looks a little different in different times, but it needs to be a value in our life. And I think it's something that um, if we prioritize it, it doesn't really matter what the circumstances around us are like. For example, um, me, silence doesn't mean absolute silence. It means being on a different floor um, or room than the people in my house. Maybe I'll hear their noises. Maybe I'll hear a game or a TV show. Um, but it's rather than it, instead of trying to get rid of noise um, outside, I think it's more about the noise inside um, when it comes to silence. And solitude, I find, is... Um, I like to think of that as being alone with intention, not just being alone. Um, so when you are in, you know, solitary confinement in a prison, you're forced to be alone and that's agonizing. But rather when you go for a walk in the woods, um, at, you know, on, on nicer times, um, that's a choice. And so if we can choose to be alone at times, um, it changes the mood and the mindset of that. And so I really, in a sense, to me, Silence and solitude in my house um, is always chaotic because uh, I have kids here whether or not it's quarantine, quarantine time or whatever. Um, and so I think it's more of the mindset you approach it with, the value you put on it, rather than the, the circumstances that surround you physically. Uh, because there can be much noisier times than what we're facing right now in life as well. Mm. Yeah, Robin, do you have anything to add to that? No, no that's Stay pretty good. I like that idea of it's not just about external noise, but the internal noise. And this morning I, I sat down at this desk and I just feel like I crashed into work this morning and I couldn't get my, my mind to be still. And I was actually trying to read my Bible here. And I just realized I'm like, I need to move to this chair right over here. And as I just sat in my rocking chair, there was just something about just the space. I could still hear the kids jumping around, but there's something about just like, this is a place where I pause and I forget about the to-do list. I leave them five feet further away from me. And there's something about that in the midst of this season. And, and a lot of this is, yeah, some of you are like, this is just my life with young kids or with two jobs or being an entrepreneur. Uh, so these are skills that are going to serve us well in the long term. So uh, here's another question that came in. Losing a loved one is generally hard to accept, but there is, they say, to some degree, closure. What sort of closure would one have when losing a loved one to COVID and not having much opportunity to have closure with that loved one? Robin, you want to jump on that question? Yeah. And, you know, for the person who asked this question, if, if, that's, if that's you, like, that's a hard time. And, and we just really do sympathize with you. There are a lot of people who are facing that right now. The interesting thing is we now know about all of this, but this actually goes on all the time. So me and my family, we were immigrants to Canada and all our family uh, lived in Barbados. So I lost all of my grandparents from far away. I didn't have an opportunity to be with them when they were dying. I didn't have an opportunity to go to their funeral. Uh, and, and as you know, this happens with people regularly just because we live in such a, a global community. Um, and that's not to minimize the pain. It's just that I think now it's coming to the fore just how much of a ritual species we are. Humanity needs ritual. We need these closure moments, whether it's a graduation, a wedding, a funeral. And so my you know, counsel would be, yeah, this is really hard. This, this sucks that you could not be there. It's painful. But I would just really encourage you and those who are grieving with you to come up with new rituals. 
Mm. Uh, whether it's to write that eulogy that you'll never get to deliver, whether it's to deliver the eulogy on Facebook, whether it's to create some kind of a Facebook group where you share memories. Uh, one day you will be able to connect, hopefully, and, and go through some kind of a grieving process together. Mm. But in the meantime, you know, those rituals are important. They just need to be new and different. Um, so I would just encourage you to, to find something that you can bring closure to this, even though it may be, as I say, a temporary closure. Hopefully when this is all over, you can gather with those loved ones. It won't be the same. It'll be different. Uh, but in the meantime, find a ritual or two that, that you can bring closure to this for yourself. Mm, well, that's good. That's good. Daniel, do you have any thoughts on that one? Or? Yeah, I just think, admit that things suck. Um, it's a hard time. Loss is terrible no matter the circumstance. Allow yourself to grieve, validate the feelings you feel, and just accept that things are different and that's terrible. Um, and be okay with feeling that and just keep going. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Yeah, the, the importance of lamenting in this season. Mm -hmm. um, and Jeff spoke of that in the Monday Five this week. I just think it's so important. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, here's another one, kind of pivoting to question on Sabbath. Robin spoke about Sabbath. I love that language of an mm -hmm. oasis. Um, how does volunteering and the Sabbath work? And I think what that is is like, hey, like, I got the guy on the stage or the girl on the stage saying, you can rest. And then it's like, we need you in the parking lot. Our kids ministry is struggling, right? Like we need drummers. We always need drummers. We need drummers. <laughs> um, so how do we, how do we justify those two things? And is it just like, are we just hoping that people ignore part of it? And um, can I, I'll just speak to this one a little bit. Cause this is one I've wrestled with a lot. So just a few things I've seen people do over the years. Um, number one is, uh, in the command to rest on the seventh day, it's also kind of implicit you work six days. And so some Jesus followers that I know, they've kind of said, well, you know what? Um, I'm in a season of life where my job only takes five days. And so they actually choose, they're going to Sabbath on Saturday and uh, they're actually going to give their their sixth day, their Sunday uh, to their church community. So I was part of a church plant where we set up and tore down every week. So I knew a lot of people uh, who on Sundays, they were in a sense working six hours, just setting up and tearing down and running the lights and sound. And they loved it, but they also realized it was tiring. And so they would Sabbath on Saturday. So that's a really creative and, and beautiful thing. And there's many Lakesiders who do that. They generously um, give half a day or a day to the community and serving in different ways. And even now people are doing that on phone calls and, and caring and groceries and all that. So that's fantastic. That's a great way to do it. Another way, Jesus talked about this. I don't know how you guys will feel about this because Jesus said some really interesting and controversial things about Sabbath, but uh, Jesus said it's okay to do good on the Sabbath. And there's different ways to interpret that. But I, let me give you an example. I knew a worship leader, uh, and in this time we were in a small church, and so she led every single Sunday, which, which was a lot. But she just basically made her worship leading part of her Sabbath ritual. So instead of kind of crashing in on a Sunday morning and, oh, I have to get up early and I got to lead it again, she showed up an hour earlier than call time and hung out with the TEP crew, brought them coffee, just delighted in people. Then she led worship. She delighted in God, delighted in the community. And then she was always, always the last person to leave the building. She just turned her service into active worship where she's like, if I don't do this, like it's part of my Sabbath ritual that's gone. And so there's just a way in which um, I think in this season where many people in our churches their volunteer role, in a sense, has been put on pause. This is a great time to reflect on it and say, is this life-giving? Is there something maybe I'm supposed to pivot towards? Or is there, this is a great time uh, to use this, this desert time, uh, this, this time away to reflect on that and think, how, how do I make this more Sabbath-like? Or is this something that in the future I maybe wouldn't go back to because it isn't restful and it doesn't help me love God more and love the people around me more and, you know, engage with the Spirit. So, those are some of my thoughts. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that, if it's all heresy or what. All heresy. <laughs> well, I kind of, you know, when we look at Sabbath, particularly when Jesus came along and he said, you know, um, we are Lord of the Sabbath, or I am Lord of the Sabbath, not the other way around. And, and when we look through the whole scripture, we see Sabbath was a whole orientation. It wasn't particularly a day. The day was the practice, but the practice fostered a whole orientation of dependence on God. So you figure this was written to an agrarian society. They depended on the weather. 
So if it's raining for six solid days and you've got to get that crop out of the ground, but guess what? It's sunny on the Sabbath day. You can't take the crop out of the ground. And when we look at that, we just think, oh my goodness. But it, it really trained them in dependence on God. It trained them in contentment. And I think when you live out of an orientation of Sabbath, when you live in a place of contentment rather than constant striving, you will actually find and create those Sabbath experiences, whether it's a whole day, whether it's a Saturday or a Sunday, you will just make a point of creating that, that time. And, and, and then that time will in turn feed the orientation. So it's, it's almost like a, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the practice first, and then the orientation or the orientation and then the practice. And I think it's a symbiotic relationship, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Dana, you have a thought? Yeah, chickens make eggs and eggs make chickens. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, profound. No, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, no, I agree. And I, I just thinking of the whole, you know, Jesus's famous line of um, Sabbath was made for humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. Um, and when we try to place so much rules and regulations around the Sabbath, we miss the point of it. Um, and so I really see when we see Sabbath as a blessing, um, not as a, oh, I have to take a break. Um, I remember my dad, you know, always reminding me of how Sabbath was the worst thing for him growing up because he wasn't allowed to play road hockey with his friends. Um, and I'm like, to me, that's not Sabbath, rather that's rules. Um, and so Sabbath, I think, is delighting and enjoying in what God has, has gifted you with, what God has given you. Um, and so, you know, like it's like for me i i think god has gifted um, me in in a way of you know reading and interpreting and teaching scripture and so on the sabbath do i then refrain from reading and interpreting scripture no i love to do that and so um using our gifts on the sabbath is fine i believe and i think that because that allows us to connect more with god um to rejoice more in him and so serving and volunteering um, on a Sabbath day, I think can actually um, increase our ability to rest because we are living out who we're called and who we're designed to really be, um, which I think is really a healthy practice also. Yeah, I love that uh, you, can, you can search the scriptures, but you don't find a lot of actual Jesus telling people how to Sabbath. I think he understands yeah. that we're all so unique and what's restful for you is not restful for me. And I love one of the gifts that Trefina has just given me over the last 10 years of marriage is just asking this simple question, what, what's restful for you? If it's road hockey, great. If it's mountain biking, great. I don't write any sermons on the Sabbath. That's not restful. I love it, but it's not restful. So God bless you, Daniel, but I'm not picking up a commentary on it. <laughs> um, it's, it's when I read all the weird books that are like debating topics because I just love that. <laughs> yeah. See, I mow my lawn on the Sabbath. That's so restful. And Robin loves lawn mowing. No, <laughs> not on my Sabbath, ever. No, ever. never, ever. I think the one thing that if we could keep in our mind that Sabbath actually is for freedom. Yes. So what brings you freedom? Yes. Sabbath is for joy. Sabbath, Sabbath is for replenishment. If it replenishes you, then it's a Sabbath activity. That's good. I love that. So then here's a, here's a follow-up. Is Sabbath a 24-hour period? For the Jews, it was. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, it was. And then Jesus kind of blows it up, but he doesn't get rid of it. So, 24 hours or? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it needs to be 24 hours. I think that is an ideal. I think one of the neat things when we study scripture and soak in it, we realize it's not a book of rules. It's a book of wisdom. And the trick for us as Jesus followers and as those who help others follow Jesus is what do we do? with this book of wisdom. What was true in first century Israel was not true in sixth century BC. Israel is not true in the year, you know, 2020 for us. And so how, what does Sabbath look like for us? And again, we just come back to freedom. Um, you know, if you figure you sleep for, I don't know, six, seven, eight hours, well, there's, there's eight hours, hours of Sabbath right out of the 24. Um, but one of my professors, he said, you know, Eat the foods you love on the Sabbath. Do the things you like on the Sabbath. Maybe your Sabbath is only half a day, but maybe in another season of your life, your Sabbath is two days, or maybe it's two hours every day. 
I don't think we're bound to 24 hours. I think we have been given an incredible amount of freedom. And I think we're actually scared of living in that freedom. I really do. I think we're, we're, we would rather live with rules because they're safe, they're boundary. We know we can check the box. But when we're given all this freedom, we're just like, oh, I don't know, am I practicing Sabbath or aren't I? And you know, when you think, am I living out of a Sabbath orientation? Uh, and Sabbath is actually a signpost to Jubilee. It's a signpost to, you know, complete freedom. Yeah. So, and release from enslavement and all of that. And so I think just, just relax. Don't count the hours, you know, count the orientation. Uh, Daniel, any thoughts on 24 hours being the literal Sabbath or? Yeah. Um, yeah, I find it. So like, I know people and I've read of people who they practice it like six o'clock to six o'clock. That's my Sabbath and nothing's getting in the way. All my notifications are off my phone goes in a drawer, that kind of thing. And that's me. If that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if that's you, you do it. Um, <laughs> you know, for others, others of us, it's, it's not always that exact time. Sometimes um, for me personally, like I would switch the day of the week. It is depending on what the week looks like um, mm -hmm. and depending on my family schedule. So before my kids were in school, I loved Sabbathing on a Monday or a Friday because I was like, um, we're all together, but now they're in school. And I'm like, we, I want to Sabbath together. And so, you know, Saturdays, but then Saturday, sometimes things come up because it's Saturday. Um, and Sundays are month or, or whatever day of the week you want to call Sunday. Um, so to me, I'm, I'm, I'm flexible in the sense of it's a priority. Um, but I believe that if you have to move things around, like we talked about earlier with Jesus um, and having those different seasons and different times, I think that's okay. But you need to be um, aware of when you are not prioritizing it and when you are ignoring that because you, you start to notice that, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, that you're getting exhausted and you need that rest, um, that, that freedom. Um, I love that, that language of it. And so, yeah, to me, I'm like, there's flex in that. Um, and I think it's more of a, a blessing on us rather than, you know, a rule or something that we need to do. Oh, maybe we'll summarize it. Note, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Robin. No, on that note, I just want to say, so Mark, you know, I think there is wisdom in actually scheduling. Like you say, that's me. That, because that actually gives you freedom. Because yeah. you can say no. And you can turn off your phone and you know that that 24 hour period is yours or yours and God's yeah. or Trifina's and God's or however. So I think, you know, really it, as an individual, we have to say, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, can I be trusted to have a flexible Sabbath? Oh. Right. Or uh, do I enjoy yeah. more freedom by having a fixed Sabbath? And I think for a lot of people, a fixed Sabbath is, is much easier yeah. uh, and, and much more freeing. Oh. Just give us permission. I think that's a really wise qualification. Different personality types will engage with that differently. Um, yeah. And if I don't lock it in, then it'll just be an excuse to do more work. And I end up more like the Israelites where I'm enslaved that I don't know how to be free and I haven't received the gift from God, which is that of Sabbath. So um, and yeah, other people are wired differently. So those are good. Um, let me ask this. Uh, Robin, you said something that I wrote down and thought, ooh, that feels controversial when you're preaching. Uh, even, even though I, I think, I, I, think I know what you're saying, but you're like, when you're talking about Sabbath and you just, you just kind of have these like mic drop moments and you don't even acknowledge them. You just kind of walk on and keep preaching. But you're like, God desires relationship over obedience. And I was like, ooh, tell us a bit about that. Because some people were like, what? Yeah, and, and, it, and it really is quite simple. I, I didn't mean it to be a mic drop moment. Um, relationship will almost always lead to obedience. But obedience won't necessarily lead to relationship. And God really is about relationship. That is what he wanted from the beginning. The opening pages of scripture, we see God wanting a relationship with people. And, you know, with your own family, your own kids, your own parents, when you love someone, you really do want to honor them. You want to respect them. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about that is when we think of the laws or commands or rules or however you want to think of obedience, they were given to us for our thriving, for our flourishing, not to, you know, wreck our lives and make our lives more miserable. And so on the one hand, God wants relationship and he's given us these boundaries and said, this is how you have a great life, not, not to ruin it. 
So I just think, yeah, when we're in relationship with God, we understand God's heart for us. And those rules, regulations, commands, however you want to call them, actually are gifts. They're gifts to thriving, gifts to flourishing, uh, gifts to freedom. So yeah, relationship breeds obedience, but obedience doesn't necessarily breed relationship. I love that. I, I like to say that the Christian life is one of living in response to love. Yeah. And that's, mm-hmm. yeah, so good. And I think that's uh, something that Lakeside's so passionate about. And as a community, it's so many people who have come, their first thing they say is like, oh, I, I just thought it was about following rules. And it's like, no, no, it's about following Jesus and responding to his love. And when you love someone, you want to know about them and you want to know how you love them more. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so good. I love that. God desires relationship over obedience. Let's go to our last question. What is, okay, so this is going with the Simplicity Week. What does simplicity look like in an affluent society? Is there a rubric or what's the rubric? Should we all sell everything and give it to the poor? That seems to be what Jesus said when he was preaching, or not preaching, he was calling out the rich young ruler, right? He's like, hey, just go sell everything and give it to the poor. So, Daniel, do you want to speak to that on, in the sense of like, how do, what do we do with that passage? Because I think so much confusion comes when we see something in Scripture and we're like, well, Jesus said it, so we all need to do it. What do you think on that? Yeah, I actually never heard that passage before. So I'm going to go sell my guitars right now. Um, <laughs> no, I think that um, if you read that passage, it's funny because they call him the rich young ruler. They don't call him, you know, the poor old ruler or whatever. They describe his current situation, um, how he's known and that sort of thing. And really, it's interesting um, in my mind because it's really Jesus is talking to what he idolizes in life, what he places priority on. And that is his wealth, his 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 finances his stability and his own income and i think that um perhaps if you idolize money over everything else in your life and that is what's keeping you from a life with jesus maybe you do need to sell everything Mm -hmm. um but i don't think that that is necessarily true for all of us um if you look for example at abraham um god didn't tell abraham was a rich uh, a rich guy and god didn't say abraham i want you to give all your stuff to me but rather he said i want you to give me your son um and that was what he prioritized most and uh, in his life and so um i really think that that passage um and that principle is really talking about this idea of the things that are distracting us um from a life um, with jesus at the center of it um, those things need to go. And, and you can think to yourself, probably we all have different things that try to take that top spot at times. Um, and it doesn't mean necessarily like if your relationship with your spouse maybe takes top spot, sometimes you shouldn't toss away your spouse. Um, rather there's wisdom in that. Um, there's a principle to that. And I think that, um, you guys can probably speak to this as well, but just because we have been, um, gifted and blessed with certain things doesn't mean that we shouldn't, um, allow ourselves to be a part of them you know i think back to some of the um monks and and different people in history who really practiced this idea of um scarcity and asceticism and i i just remember there's um certain people who used to um, take animal pelts like wolf skin and other ones that were um kind of rough and they'd wear them inside out against their body so that if they indulge too much in food um the animal fur would stab them in the stomach (laughs) so um it's super legalistic and and odd um and so i think when we um if we believe that if we get rid of all of our stuff that'll make us close to god um i think we're missing the mark in that point Hmm. robin you want to jump in on animal pelts worn inside out (laughs) Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do think, it, you know, Jesus modeled generosity. He had rich patrons that funded his ministry, yes. uh, that clothed him, fed him, and put him up. And so uh, now Jesus had, you know, harsh words against wealth. He spoke more about poverty than he did about heaven and hell, and we know that. Uh, so his focus was on the vulnerable, and his call to following was one of, self-sacrifice um, and generosity. And I think that needs to be forefront in our minds always. And we can always do a self-check. Like how, how, how much of a hold does this have on me? And I think it's really important. Um, you know, the, the accountability piece, you asked me at the beginning, you know, what do I do? Well, one of the things that, that I'm responsible for at Lakeside is, is small groups. And, um, you know, small groups are those places where we, forge relationships that are authentic and honest 
and loving and confidential and places that we can hold one another accountable. And, and, and I just think it's, again, we, we live in freedom, but we always have to be self-checking. Does this have a hold on me? Um, a pastor I heard once, and I actually think it might have been Sundar Mark, uh, oh, said, you know, God my pastor. isn't interested. Yeah, I think it might have been him. God isn't as interested in how much we give as in how much we keep. I was uh, just about to say that. My pastor taught me that. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I think just, yeah, living out of that generous heart. Mm. Uh, does, do my belongings own me or do I own my belongings? Or actually, do I allow God to own them? Yeah, I think you guys nailed it, both of you, on just talking about that. And um, that will probably be another roundtable discussion. But it's interesting that tithing doesn't make its way into the New Testament. The New Testament is all about what the people kept for themselves, not about the amount that they gave. And so it really is about how, how, how much of this is actually taking a grip on you versus does Jesus have your heart? Does he, does he have that number one spot? And is everything that we do, including our time, our energy, our resources, our money, is it all his? Uh, and is it all ready to be given at a moment's notice to serve him? And Robin highlighted as well, serving the poor. So, well, guys, thanks so much. Our time is coming to an end, but that's our first round table. So again, if you're listening, please let us know a good name, a better name than Daniel's names, maybe. And yeah, come on. Uh, have a round table. Yeah. You realize that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and yeah, we'll see you this Sunday. We're starting a brand new series and you'll be able to, uh, ask any questions. We'd love for you to send some questions in response to that. And we'll be back, I think, next week if you guys are up for it. Um, and also let us know what you think about Daniel's mustache. It's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye. All right, guys. Thanks so much Bye. for your time. We'll talk to you Bye. next time. See you later. See you.